Hi, I'm Jocelyn Taylor, and you're watching Dyke TV, television to incite, subvert, provoke, and organize. Welcome to the best of Summer 94. This season, we feature the International Dyke March in New York City in June, and we bring you the most extensive coverage of the Girls of the Gay Games. In the arts, we feature filmmaker Shu Li Chang, and in our travel section, we'll visit the lesbian mecca, Provincetown. But first, the news roundup. Some say it was the proper ending to a decade-long internal battle. Others say that lesbians and gays succumbed to right-wing pressure. In the end, ILGA, the International Lesbian and Gay Association, voted to expel NAMBLA, the North American Man-Boy Love Association, and other pedophile groups. In doing so, ILGA maintained its groundbreaking consultative status at the United Nations. This is not an ideological decision. I mean, it's a question of priority, and the condition that we are taking this decision is we don't have the power. It is a political decision. I think that over the years it's become more clear that whilst we encourage child sexuality and believe that children should have the right to experiment, there's a difference when you're talking about 12-year-olds playing with 13-year-olds or 8-year-olds playing with 9-year-olds is when you're talking about a generational gap of possibly two or three times their age. Children and youth must have the absolute right to say no. They must have the absolute right to control their own bodies and they have the right, however, to say yes and to be sensual to adults, to other uh, adolescents and to children. I we said to, to you, we have to hatred can never we lead to, to liberation, that's all I said. As a 14-year-old gay boy coming out, realizing my sexuality, growing up in the suburbs of New York where there weren't any gay people, my relationships with men um, were what liberated me, what gave me hope for my sexuality and made um, what could have been a bad situation lots of fun. So it's turning into a feminist versus the paedophile argument and I think that that's dangerous. I just think that, that feminists and lesbians have spent a lot longer looking at the power differential and how that breaks down and for us the power imbalance between younger people and old people is as clear as the power imbalance between black people and white people, upper class people, lower class people, men and women. And I think that what we have to look at is to say who is our constituency? Is our constituency a group of predominantly white men and looking after their sexual interests or is our commitment to our community working on people who have no voice, working on people who can't be members of the ILGA because they're likely to be killed if they join the ILGA? Where do we draw the line? A resolution to condemn violence and prejudice against lesbian and gay students in public schools was overwhelmingly defeated by the Colorado Parent Teachers Association. The resolution was drafted by a PTA subcommittee with the intent of helping lesbian and gay students better survive public schools. Right-wing forces mobilized against the resolution. A tolerance resolution, I think, would have really helped gay youth. It would have helped administrators um, and, and teachers have a tool to be able to discipline gay bashers. Um, it would have given gay, lesbian, and bisexual youth um, access to, to information, which is important. Um, at the same time, a resolution from PTA is just recommendations. And, and it's not passing school policy, but it is a start. And um, so I am very disappointed that that didn't happen. But on the other side, I do feel like there was a lot of coalition building. A few years ago, you were talking about me and color and racism. Homosexuality basically is the same thing. We deal with the same sort of feelings. And if you've ever been bashed because you're black or any other color or because you're gay, then you'll know. Take a walk in my shoes for 10 days and find out what this is all about. I think a lot of people saw the far right for, for who they are and what they're trying to do. Many of the homosexual political leaders around the nation, including uh, Perry Jude Vatikai and uh, Scott McAgow with the National Gay Lesbian Task Force, Donna Minkowitz, who's a major writer, have all made very clear that that recruitment is a major part of the homosexual. <laughs> if you take a morally neutral position to homosexuality, you are recruiting. There is no way I can say to my nine-year-old boy, look, if you think you feel this way, it's okay, as long as you accept yourself. That's recruitment, no matter how sophisticated and academic it is. 
Last year, the Cobb County Board of Commissioners in Atlanta approved a resolution condemning the gay lifestyle. A coalition of political groups organized intensively against ACOG, the Atlanta Committee for the Olympic Games, which had scheduled its preliminary volleyball competitions in Cobb. Dyke TV was there. We're here protesting an Olympic venue in Cobb County. They're going to put women's preliminary volleyball out in Cobb County, uh, the place that has a resolution on the books saying how much they hate gays. And if they don't move the venue, we intend to raise the alarm up till and including the 96 Olympics. We will make them very, very sorry they ever thought of having gays in Cobb. Coke is an Olympic sponsor, and they need to know that hatred in Cobb County is the real thing. It's time they ended their silence and stood up for what they say they believe in. They're sponsors. Do they want to be associated with the hate and bigotry? When the Cobb County Commissioners rescind their resolution, uh -huh. then this will all be over. A small but mighty group of people convincing the International Olympic Community Committee that this was not a place to hold an Olympic event that represented international brotherhood and sisterhood. You should be so proud. While the religious right wing regularly airs its programming on local and national networks, lesbian and gay television across the country continues to be threatened by the right wing. Dyke TV spoke with producers in Washington, D.C. and Florida. We had one complaint letter written to the Trinity Broadcasting Group out of Santa Ana, California. And this was someone in a right wing capacity, I would imagine. And Trinity Broadcasting, which also purchased airtime on the same, same TV stations that I was uh, airing on, forced the owner or threatened the owner that if the show was not canceled that they would cancel all their broadcasting uh, commitments in all of his markets. Well, business being business, he canceled the show. When I helped start a show back in 1989 called Gay Fairfax, uh, a group, two groups came out. The um, Foundation for Moral Restoration was one and Citizens Against Pornography was the other one and they threatened to boycott the cable system to get us off the air. But more recently, when I premiered my show in Calvert County, uh, Maryland, very conservative county, um, the young Republicans came out against the show and also threatened to um, get us off the air. Well, I think Queer TV is very important any time that you can get your message out. Grassroots fundamentalists in the right wing use it as their medium. That's how they get the millions of dollars, the support and the numbers together is through the television medium. One important thing to do is to continue to doing the type of program we're doing, showing positive images of gays and lesbians on television where everyone can see them, and I think slowly that will change attitudes. That's it for the News Roundup. Next is Eyewitness with a special feature on the International Dyke March in New York City. Absolutely. But we also care about 
changing the second class status of women. We care about making the world a safer place because, you know, we deal and live with violence. We care about economic issues because we get paid less than men do. There's a lot of things that we have to bring to the forefront, mostly things like breast cancer and things that affect the lesbian community. Uh, parental rights is a big thing for us, the ability to adopt my lover's uh, little girl. So that's what we're marching for today. <laughs> Why am I here? Because I am lesbian and I am proud and I am beautiful and I am Latina. What more can I say? Hola, adios, mis amigas. important to have a separate dyke march because when boys march with us we disappear and so this way they can't ignore us and we're making too much noise to turn down. I think that lesbians are still very uh, afraid of taking public spaces and being out and visible in public and that we tend to get lost when we look at issues of lesbian and gay rights and I think that we need to see each other we really need to be together publicly. there's violence against lesbians and gays. I don't think that there are any laws right now that are really addressing the basic issues of civil rights for lesbians and gays. And we're under attack incredibly in this country. So we need this kind of march more than ever. Uh, it's very important to, to say we're not going to take it anymore. Not in Mississippi, not in New York, no matter where you're at, we're just not going to take it anymore. We're tired of it. Like one of my favorite activists from Mississippi, Miss Fannie Lou Hamer, when she got sick and tired of being sick and tired, and that was her favorite word, she said it's time to do something. And that's the way it is here all over North America. We are saying we are sick and tired of being sick and tired, and we want some laws to protect our people. We need civil rights laws to protect us. We're from Camp Sister Spirit, and we have suffered for the last six and a half months over a page and a half of hate crimes. President Clinton, wake up. Our blood is in your streets. You need to do something to protect us. Twenty years ago now, we started a softball team here. We started playing softball on Sundays, and gradually it worked itself into a team, mostly because we wanted a uniform. My catcher on on my team is was at the gay games in Vancouver, and she ran a tri triathlon and won a gold medal, and it was so meaningful to her. 
So I thought that this was this was fun, and what did I always want to do? And I've always wanted to, I've always wanted to grease myself up and show my muscles. And I have worked out a lot, you know. I have uh, I've done I've done a lot of uh, you know Nautilus and things like that over the years. So I wasn't in too bad shape. But you know, after you go through menopause and you get in your 60s, your body begins to sag. I'm 65 years old. There aren't that many 65-year-old women go take their clothes off in public and put on these little patches and stuff. So I probably go win me some kind of a medal if I go there. So I'm going to do it. for fun, but there's some part of it that's also serious. And I have been working really serious at this, and we're learning how to pose. My big problem is not taking off my clothes, oddly enough. It's wearing that, wearing that thing. I mean, I haven't worn a bra, God, it's been a hundred years, you know? And I don't want to wear one, and I don't want to wear, I don't, I don't see any point in covering up my breasts. I mean, everybody's seen breasts. Mine are a little saggier than most, but who the hell cares? I would be happy to get up there and pose without a stitch on. my body and do this and I never could figure out how to quite do it. Well I love being up there on that stage doing this stuff. I loved it. It's great, you know. It's great. Your body feels good and I can see myself in the mirror and I can see my muscles coming up and everybody was cheering and what better what what could be better? I've always been pretty much a tomboy, um, playing football with my brothers, wrestling with my brothers, you know. And uh, we were like middle income family, but still there were times when you're trying to feed five children, you know, you want to make sure you get your chicken wing or neck bone or whatever. And, uh, you know, got the person who could move the fastest and was the strongest got the last chicken wing or neck bone or whatever. The first time I wrestled, I was horrible. I got pinned. But you know, it, it was okay because even though I got pinned, I knew I was a wrestler. It's my first time being in front of a bunch of people, the, the adrenaline, the excitement. Well, then I got smart <laughs> and realized that um, if I was gonna do this thing, that I had to uh, make some kind of commitment to myself. So um, I started, uh, working out. I started watching my diet. Also, I knew that the gay games was right around the corner. So I'm putting him in the up or down position. I came in at 198 pounds. The San Francisco women, I believe one was like 5'7", um, and over 220 pounds, and one was six six feet or six one and over 220 pounds. I didn't want to see their whole bodies. I kept making my mind focus on what I could handle. <laughs> and being 5'2", I knew I could handle their legs. <laughs> my whole thing, my whole planning had been to pin her, to wait until she made a mistake and pin her. So that last time when she came charging at me, um, I use what's called torque leverage. Use her motion against her, and that's how I was able to get on top of her. It's super empowering to, to get what you want, 
You bad. I guess this is just a really femme sport and it doesn't attract a lot of dykes. We have 96 skaters coming to the games and only 14 of us are women. And this is the first time that figure skating is in the gay games. One of the most wonderful things about the games is that uh, it's inclusive, that anybody who wants to be an athlete can be an athlete in this. If you put in the work, if you want to take the risk, if you want to put yourself out there. And I think that that gives us all a, a different feeling about each other as athletes. You put in lots and lots of work and every once in a while it pays off. Every once in a while you, you go up for a jump and you know oh, this is how it should feel and you come down and you, you feel like you've just flown. One of the things that has been a little bit difficult training as a same-sex Paris team getting ready for the games is that there are not a lot of competitions that we could enter to practice. The United States Figure Skating Association defines a pair in their 480-page rule book as consisting of a man and a lady. Right. <laughs> they're not women, they're ladies. Excuse us. Well, we needed to practice, so we entered a little competition in Long Island about three or four weeks ago. We signed up for similar pairs and found ourselves skating against two 12-year-old girls who did a really cute program to Boogie Woogie Bugle Boy in these red, white, and blue starred outfits. We took the ice hand in hand, skated to our opening position, and when our music came on, um, our music is... Doris Day's Secret Love. There was dead silence in the arena. Uh, I've been in a number of competitions, but, you know, nothing has the feel that the Gay Games does. This is just an extraordinary opportunity. The idea of doing this with athletes from all over the world has just got a feeling of being home that is so wonderful. Uh, it's, uh, you know, an amazing experience. This absolutely is the most amazingly wonderful skating competition that has ever existed. All of the skaters are just saying they're flying high on yeah. the audience. It's so amazing to be applauded for being a lesbian. <laughs> Provincetown's a wonderful city for lesbians. It's basically the lesbian mecca of the United States, I think. Going into a store and seeing lesbians behind the counter, in front of the counter, on the streets, on the beach, it's like normal in Provincetown to be lesbian. The reason to come to Provincetown is because that you're able to act like a straight person acts all the time. You can hold hands with your lover, you can put your arm around her, you can walk down the street and never feel any inhibition. It's a totally safe place to be. Besides it being a wonderful town that accepts lesbians and gays, it's beautiful. I mean, we have trails and bike 
trails and the dunes and the beaches and you know the whole thing together is unbelievable it's really a very special place originally a whaling community and it was also um, an artist community going back hundreds of years. The whaling industry obviously is no longer and the fishing industry is very small right now and it's a struggling economy. Out of 351 towns in Massachusetts, this is number 350 on income and on poverty level and one of the poorest communities in the state. So one of the problems that we've been facing is how to create a different kind of economy than the fishing industry and how to entice tourists to come year after year and spend money so we can keep people employed. People identify province centers, oh, July and August, you know, when there's the beach and sunbathing and, and the bars and the shops. But to be honest with you, it's a wonderful place to be off season. It's it's quieter, there's more there's more room for um, solitude, romance, uh, there's great restaurants in town. As far as Visiting here, I think it's terrific. People should come year-round, come in the dead of winter. It's beautiful. You can walk in the dunes. You can walk the bike paths and not run into anyone. The Provincetown in any season, really. In this town, being lesbian is the norm. And, you know, at first that might not seem like a big deal, but what often happens is when women are here for a week or two um, and then they leave, then it's shocking to them and they realize how important it is to be the majority and to, to not feel like you're a minority and to not feel like you're something different. It's special. It's a very special town. My major influence was my grandmother. We're in the third generation here. My mother was a chef, my grandmother was a chef, and I wanted to learn about new American cuisine. And my family was stuck in the old traditional ways with Mexican food. I've always wanted to do Mexican cuisine and incorporate seafood, and I could never do that in any other restaurants. They didn't believe in it. Okay, at Lorraine's we're gonna have uh, one of our famous dishes called pasta caruso. Okay, we have a little uh, chorizo, which is a Spanish sausage and spices, a little shallots. I put in right away the clams because they take the longest to open up. We're also using jalapenos in this dish. sun-dried tomatoes. So what we're going to do is we're going to take brandy and we're going to flambe the brandy. We wait for the alcohol to burn off. One of the things I like the most about what I'm doing is that anything goes. That's why we call it New American Cuisine with a Mexican flair. We can make it mild, or we can make it really hot. And we add a little cream to it, a little orange juice. Pinch of salt. The last thing we do is add our shrimp. This takes about two minutes, two to three minutes, to make sure our shrimp's cooked, our clams open up. Last thing we want to do is add our pasta. This is one of my favorite dishes because I love shrimp, little necks, and it's cooked in chorizo and jalapenos. This is one of the best dishes we have in the house. The last thing we 
thing that we do is dress it with a little mix. Dining out is so important to me because you're feeding your soul. It's a good physical workout. Um, it's early in the morning. It's something that just you can do. You get, you can just go and do it. The variables are, are yourself and the vehicle. I mean, the, but trash is trash. It's Trash is a big thing here. Provincetown, we've done an awful lot. Uh, since 1990, we've been recycling cardboard, tin, plastic, uh, glass, and newspaper without a lot of support. It's been difficult. We've got people here for years through everything in the harbor. But we're dealing with, with a very old school mentality, uh, a town of 3,500 telling you can't do this anymore. It's not, you, we don't bury it. You can't throw everything away like you used to, like mattresses all have to go to special places, couches. Well, you know, for, for first of all, we know if businesses are busy, if they're not busy, uh, we know if they made good chowder or bad chowder, we know if somebody burned the burrito beans, how their trash is. It's like you can sort of say their general condition of their house and their life. It's like if their bag is like not tied up and sort of just all disarray and light, you can think, well, there's probably a lot of stuff on the floor of their car. What they read, because glossy magazines, they're trash, you know. Yeah, you can learn an awful, an awful lot from people in their trash. And I was born and raised on a farm. So, you know, you got up and you went to work. I never thought twice about it. I never thought what I did was anything different. Um, and here, you know, you rarely get any sort of reaction that you might get out of Provincetown for being a woman who picks up garbage. I used to go to the dump with my dad on Saturdays, you know, we'd load up our, we had a, 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 an F-350, uh, F we had a one-ton dump truck, and every Saturday we'd load up the 30 garbage cans that a farm would generate, and we'd drive 20 minutes to the dump, and we'd throw it off. And my, my mother isn't maybe overly thrilled, you know, but uh, when she can say that her daughter owns the trash business, it's a different story. I mean, you know, she doesn't have to tell them that I still pick it up. My father owned a farm in Connecticut, uh, and I'm one of five girls, and he didn't have any sons, and it was never, never, never an option not to work hard. If we were going to eat, if we were going to, if we wanted to have anything, we were going to work hard for it. Hello, I'm Pamela Sneed and welcome to the arts. Shu Li Chang's film, Fresh Kill, has gotten a lot of attention at festivals around the country. Let's find out why. I came to New York uh, to study cinema at uh, New York University back in 1977. And uh, after I graduated, I sort of got pretty much sucked into um, working here and started working on, as a film editor and uh, getting to know, you know, independent film scene and then got involved with Paper Tiger TV, which is a, also the public access um, cable show on uh, Manhattan Cable. And I think um, usually for that show, we usually get together on Wednesday night. And so sort of coming from that kind of public access um, background, I start to um, develop a, a way of uh, working uh, collaboratively 
and uh, develop a whole series of uh, video installation work um, sort of based on the collaborative mode of production. Interesting. I think it's like you know we were talking about that too in terms of how we all come from like uh, sort of street uh, street media activism, and so going from that and then you go back to your bedroom and trying to deal with all your own sexual desire and trying to sort of in, at times settle some of those matters. Jane was once a steady lover till one day she met another. Caused a meltdown, almost facts. Her ex chased her like Mad Max. Dee Dee had a two-track mind, but on the railway she did fine. That inner city love was cheap with MCI and so much deeper. Look, Sex Fish is a. Uh, uh, the whole piece is like a six minutes, and I think it's like it's stru structure, like uh, you know, coming to an orgasm. The, the piece ends with an orgasm, and then sex ball is actually about you know, 22 different women, and and it's kind of using the bowling and sex, sex and bowling, and uh, in that sense we call it like a multiple orgasm uh, video. So. Tasted pussy lady, discovered women were her fate when underneath the cherry tree she screamed, Kiss me, set me free. Yeah, I think the film for me is pretty subversive and, and a, lot of, a lot of challenge uh, in the film is actually how to do things differently, how to um, try to have a different way of telling the story. So like the narrative is like, you know, it's not really your conventional, very um, sort of story oriented. I mean, there is a story, but at the same time, the, the film sort of uh, following different character and then lead you to a different territory. Um, so in that sense, same thing, when we go into the, the lesbian couple's uh, lovemaking scene, it's really a matter of uh, trying to present uh, the joy or the pleasure of, of the sex, but also trying to uh, approach it uh, a little bit different than your usual, you know, uh, whichever way, you know. So it's, in a way, it's very, uh, it's, it's a subtle, but at the same time, it's a, uh, it should be a sort of orgasm um, experience.
Well, we know that lesbians are getting AIDS because they are women. Do women get AIDS? Well, then we know that lesbians are getting AIDS in some form or other, but they are because they are women. Me being a lesbian and me being HIV positive, I do know this exists. I am an HIV positive lesbian. I am a lesbian mother. I am a lesbian ex-drug user. I am a lesbian ex-alcoholic. I am an, a lesbian ex-felony offender. All of these things, heterosexual women can be and are. Why am I any different? Because I call myself a lesbian. Well, in my clinical practice, where I have um, had a lot of opportunity to talk to a lot of women, at least a third of the women that I interview have had sexual relationships and intimate relationships with other women. Um, so whatever statistics are floating around out there, they really don't apply, at least in the settings that I've worked in. And at least 10 or 12 or 15 percent of women that I talk to are in relationships with other women now. It's not just anecdotal, okay? Um, the AIDS Institute had a round table last year and there are about 40 of us there talking about, you know, lesbians with AIDS. We all work with lesbians with AIDS. Uh, and it covered the gamut. The vast majority of lesbians that I know who are HIV infected have had um, uh, the risk of, in, of IV drug use. Um, or sex with a male partner who was an IV drug user at some time. I mean, those are the, the big risks. Um, I have met a woman who was HIV positive who very credibly, in my opinion, um, was, was infected by her female lover. Um, there was no other risk of transmission during the time the transmission occurred. And I've talked to other clinicians who've met a woman here and there who can report, credibly report, woman-to-woman -woman transmission. It clearly has occurred. It's been reported in the medical literature. It's possible. Does it happen easily? No. Its occurrence has been, uh, it's been quite rare. So it's, it's like many other issues. The risk needs to be put into perspective. But to say there's no risk is to lie to women. A woman who is using drugs women are much more likely to be HIV positive if they are lesbian identified than if they are um, bisexual and more likely in both cases than if they are women who consider themselves to just be women having sex with women. Now what is that about? That to me, you know, when I see that stuff, what that is about is that lesbians think that they can't get AIDS. My experience is that when women in the lesbian community and in the feminist community started talking about lesbians and HIV infection, there was a tremendous focus on woman-to-woman -woman transmission. But there seemed to be a real inability in the early years of the epidemic for lesbians and for women in general who were talking about risk factors to talk about IV drug use. It's the issue that didn't get talked about that created a sort of class line in terms of the lesbian community and how we dealt with HIV. Because really, if the focus continues to be on woman-to-woman -woman transmission as a way of avoiding talking about IV drug use in our community, then we're never really going to get at what the issues are. They're both important, but the majority of lesbians who are HIV infected are, um, are reflective of the general population of women who are HIV infected. They're poor inner city women of color predominantly. Um, and so I would like all those other women who say lesbians don't get HIV to talk to some of the women that I've met and that I, I've seen and like shared experiences with because they're very much out there and the numbers are growing. First of all, who's to define what, who is a lesbian? You could have been married for 10 years and uh, your husband passed away or whatever and now you're in a relationship with a woman. To say to those women that they're not positive and as lesbians you're, you're not embracing them in the community, that's bullshit. If I go into a lesbian community, uh, so to speak, I can't just divulge that I'm HIV positive. First of all, it's the rejection, you know, when you find out and who do you tell. I mean, it's even harder because you're a lesbian, you know, and the stigma behind it is like so great. And 
so you have, you know, the asexual, you, you, you know, your lesbianism working against you, then the fact that you're HIV, which might lead to the fact that you use drugs at one time, and like, you know, people looking at you like you're the lowest low. The isolation is enormous. It's an enormous factor. Um, and what many gay women choose to do about it is to um, remain more in the closet about their lesbianism than ever before. Let's face it, ladies, it's happened to the best of us. You flush, not giving it a second thought, when two minutes later, you think, hey, it's still flushing. Let's see what the highly capable and talented gals at Dyke TV did when this happened to our toy. We've been in this space literally for 10 months. The toilet has not worked since the day we came. What usually happens actually is I walk, I walk in here and the toilet's running. Yeah, I never have any problems with that toilet. And even though I put up this sign, which, you know, which you think would scare people. Let's just do it. It doesn't. People just leave. Well, maybe I'll just sneak out. <laughs> um, people have tried to fix it. A number of people have tried to fix it. Many attempts have been made. The best that we could uh, achieve was uh, a jiggling of the handle to keep it from running incessantly, and that's the method that we use now. Flush. It's beautiful. And then you have to rest. Sometimes work. I'm good at this. I do this at home every day. You just sort of bounce it up and down. You just have to have the right touch. That's right. And you can tell it makes a sound, but it's kind of bad. Okay. Okay, this is how I do it. So that, that's the story, and the only thing, only thing else that we can possibly do is just to move, move entirely out of the space, never to see that toilet again, and that's what we're going to do. We're moving at the first of the month. So here I am at the new Dyke TV bathroom. Pretty glamorous, huh? And the best part is that it's building maintained. So ladies. When you're confronted with this situation, yeah, you could move. However, I recommend that you lower your pride and call the plumber first. It's a lot easier. Anyway, that's all we have time for tonight. So long from the Fat Girls. Hey out there in TV land. If you like what you see and you believe in the importance of lesbians on television, then listen up. Dyke TV needs your help now to stay on the air. Pledge your support by becoming a member. Only $25 entitles you to our quarterly newsletter and the satisfaction of being part of the effort. Make your checks out to Sang Freud and send them to Dyke TV, P.O. Box 55, Prince Street Station, New York, New York, 10012. Or call us at 1-800-310-DYKE. It's me and my two sisters. All of us together represent every sexuality for a woman. The tall one with the legs, my, that's my oldest sister. She's heterosexual and married. The one who's a little bit sassy over to the right is my other sister, Sharon. She's bisexual. And that's uh, me over to the left, trying to be my little lesbian self. 
Now, clearly, this is me before my mom has gotten to me to beautify, to put big bows in, and to put me in a dress. I'm wearing my favorite sort of get around gear at the time, which were pants and any kind of loose fitting shirt. Unfortunately, I didn't have a pair of DMs at the time, so I had to go with my Kimberly Kelly shoes. And this is the dreaded photo day. Here I am trying my best to be heterosexual. I've got my little dress going. But as you can see, even my lesbian hair refuses to conform to mainstream visual beauty ex expectations. And my hair is just going all over the place trying to find like a place to be its lesbian self. Here I am in, of all places, uh, Seattle, Washington. I'm about 17, and I'm given the audience a little bit of leg. That's sort of my trademark, my flexibility. Um, I've used it to get babes since this photo was taken. And here I am enjoying that first cigarette after a sexual encounter. I'm about 20, maybe 21, at uh, Vassar College, haven of lesbianism, or so it was for me. Um, I'm not really friends with the woman who took the photograph, who was the one I was having my sexual encounter with, but it was very pleasant in the moment, and uh, I thank her wherever she is. And here I am in P-Town, on the beach. I've fulfilled my lesbian journey, and uh, I'm here to say, you know, to any lesbians out there who are lesbian children, rock on. Okay, so this is me coming out at the front door of the house to go to the hospital to have open heart surgery in 1966 when I was nine years old. And they wanted to get a couple pictures of it because they weren't really sure if I was coming back. That's my Raggedy Ann. <laughs> This is the backyard, my brother and I having a big water fight. If there was sound to this, you'd hear a lot of screaming from me. We put the high power nozzle on the hose and <laughs> go after each other. I was probably 10 years old here in Richfield, Minnesota. You can see I'm getting the best of him here, really enjoying myself. This is Christmas 1966, and um, somebody just woke me up. I'm not very happy, and I got a Kangen roof for Christmas and that cheered me up considerably, taking Kanganru out for a little family gathering. It's my mother, cousin Kenneth, his mother, my aunt, my brother Billy, the whole family. We'd had this big snowfall and then this ice storm, and so there was a thick coating of ice over the snow, and the dog knew that. And um, my dad grabbed the camera and he used some film from the 4th of July picnic at my aunt's house the previous summer, so it's superimposed over the picnic. And you can see people having a lovely time at the picnic. There's my Aunt Margaret. Okay, this is me with my best friends, Julie and Jenny. That's Jenny on my right and Julie on my left. And we did everything together. They were three years older than me, but I was way ahead of them. They were so protected, and I told them everything they needed to know about everything. Here's a nice close-up of me. Okay, I was in dance class with Barb Sauer, with all my friends. And we um, did this dance to There's No Business Like Show Business. And it was quite fabulous, mostly because of the costumes, which Barb made with her daughter. And um, it was magenta, you can't really tell from this, and pink, and other fabulous colors. No Business Like Show Business, flat ball change, flat ball change, kick. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see that's why I'm on the stage today. That's all the Dyke TV we've got for you now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next season.
puede ser. Él con otra mujer no se atrevería. Él va a saber que conmigo no se juega. ¡Ja! Soy un fuego que no se apaga. Me debes de tener el temor. 